Okay, so this is part two of our current event and weekly Bible study for 3.30.08. We're going to continue with our look at C.S. Lewis. This next part we're going to be um, looking at as the occult fantasy part of some of his works. And this section has been excerpted from the 1985 Media Spotlight special report on C.S. Lewis, The Man and His Myths. In spite of what many believe to be brilliant exegesis, exegesis on Christian apologetics, there appears to have been in C.S. Lewis a seemingly irresistible attraction to the shadow world of the occult fantasy, a mingling of darkness with light in writings apart from his apologetics. Now, this is all through his writings, and now in today's day and age we have Harry Potter, which is of the same theme, just a little more overt. As a child, Lewis's fertile imagination was greatly influenced by fantasy and fairy tales told to him by his mother. Now these are things that we shouldn't be implanting into our child's heads. They're demonic. Many of them are outright lies. Why are you wanting to teach your kids these, these things? Okay, but that's what, how he was brought up. His brilliant mind was quick to seize upon these experiences, and his favorite pastime became drawing what he later called the anthropomorphized beasts of nursery literature. He and his brother referred to them as dressed animals. Now you can see why in his writings that he believed that man was nothing more than an evolved animal. Okay, that's what he, we've already quoted these verses straight from his writings. The, he portrayed animals as basically these human-like beings, sometimes Christ-like beings. Okay, so this is why I believe they were so elevated. Lewis's early favorite literature included E. Nibbet's trilogy, Five Children and It, The Phoenix and the Wishing Carpet and the Amulet, all occult fantasies. Even after having been a professing Christian for 25 years, he maintained, I can still read them with delight. So much was Lewis's life steeped in the fantasy that he wrote, this is unbelievable, this is a quote, the central story of my life is about nothing else. This is this fantasy world that he lived in. So the central story of my life is about nothing else? What about Christ Jesus? What about the Bible? What about... No, no. It was about this, basically, this occult fantasy. From Nesbitt and Gulliver, he advanced to Longfellow's saga of King Olaf and fell in love with the magic and pagan myths of Norse legend. Well, so did Adolf Hitler. So, like, these, these, uh, these Norse pagan legends, these are some evil, purely evil, fictional, well, based on pagan mythology, probably a lot of it did happen. From a, from a witchcraft standpoint, these talk about shape-shifting, they glorify witchcraft, you know, and this is what, C.S. Lewis cut his teeth on. This is what his life, the central story of his life was about nothing else. That's his own quote. By the age of 12, there had grown in Lewis's mind an intense relationship with the world of fantasy and elves. Now, I believe what we're in reference to here is the Keebler elves, the guys that make the crackers. No, just kidding, sorry. Anyway, I fell deeply under the... Sp this is a quote from him. He said, I fell deeply under the spell of the dwarfs. The old, bright-hooded, snowy-bearded dwarfs we had in those days before Arthur Rackman sublimed or Walt Disney vulgarized, oh, Walt Disney vulgarized the dwarfs and the, the seven dwarfs, I guess. How dare him. He probably would defend the, 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 the uh, dwarfs more than he would the word of God. Obviously he would any day. So he says, you know, before this, the earthmen, this is from Lewis, quote, I visualized them, these dwarfs, so intensely that I came to the very frontiers of hallucination. Once walking in the garden, I was for a second not quite sure that a little man had not run past me into the shrubbery. I was faintly alarmed. It's from page 55. Yeah, it's not, it's not like he was. It's not like he was doing hallucinogenics. He visualized dwarfs? 
so intensely that he came to the frontiers of hallucination? Oh yeah, that happened to me last week. You know, I can really relate to him here. No, I, 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 I mean, come on. This is from his own writings. Although one would expect childhood fantasies to subside after a time, in Lewis's case, they became more of a delight as he grew older. So his whole life was based around occult lives. That was the central theme of his life. And again, are you telling me that it would be possible for you as a Christian to embrace his writings and not be influenced by the same spirits that guided him? This is dangerous. This isn't some light little issue. This is a guy that has influenced millions and millions and millions of people. Probably is responsible for untold millions of people in hell. When Lewis, is, when Lewis was sent to a boarding school in Hertfordshire, England, his first impression was one of revulsion toward the unpleasant urban environment compared to his Irish countryside. He immediately hated England. Of the same time, he writes... He writes, I also developed a great taste for all fiction I could get about the ancient world. Quio Vadis, Darkness and Dawn, The Gladiators, Ben-Hur, the attraction, as I now see, was erotic. And erotic in a rather morbid way. The interest when the fit was upon me was ravenous, like a lust. End of quote. His interest in these fictional books about the ancient world was erotic in a rather morbid way? That's not even appropriate to even say anything more about. The interest when the fit was upon me was ravenous like a lust? That's from page 35 of the thing I just referenced earlier. That How could a Christian write this way? How could a born-again Christian say this? How sick does that sound? That's how dark this man's mind was. After advancing to preparatory school at Wyvern, Lewis gradually ceased to be a Christian. He became interested in the occult and embraced an attitude of pessimism about what he considered a faulty world. His taste for the occult was nurtured and grew as he became enthralled with what Wagnerian operas and the Norse sagas derived from Celtic mythology. And again, so did Hitler. This sounds a lot like Hitler's early years to me. And later. Because he was. He was obsessed with the Norse mythology. This is where we get the whole thing about the Aryan fifth root race from. From Norse mythology. At the age of 27 having been elected fellow and tutor in the English language and literature at Magdalene College, C.S. Lewis met John Ronald Rule, Tolkien, at a meeting of the English faculty at Menton College. That was in 1926, 5.11. J.R.R. Tolkien, though wary of Lewis at first, enrolled him in the Colbiters Club, which was founded by Tolkien for the study and propagation of Norse mythology. Hey, you know, where do I sign up? This is the man that all these people are revering. And he's buddies with Tolkien, who's another devil, who took him under his wing in this club called the Coal Biters, whose, whose purpose of this club was the study and propagation of Norse mythology? This was the same time Hitler was coming to power. I bet you they thought Hitler was a pretty cool guy, if the truth be known. Hitler was studying the same things they were. And so were a lot of other Aryan Germans. It's great company, you know, to be around. The two became close friends, sharing their common interest in occult fantasy. Tolkien argued that there is an inherent truth in mythology. All pagan religions point in the direction of God. Though this faulty through this faulty argument, Lewis reasoned that the story of Christ to be a true myth. Okay, a myth such as the same, much the same as others, but a myth that really happened. Boy, that sounds like a really strong biblical stance to me. 
<clears throat> it was during their long association that both Lewis and Tolkien developed their most prestigious sword and sorcery material. Quote, sword and sorcery material. Sorcery? Like witchcraft? Yeah, you heard me right. Tolkien, of course, became well known for his mythological tale, The Hobbit, and his later work, The Lord of the Rings, released as three volumes. The Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, The Return of the King. Lewis turned to expounding intermittently on Christian apologetics and to writing fantasy. Perhaps the best known fantasy from Lewis's pen is the seven volume Chronicles of Narnia. We're going to talk more about this later. In, <clears throat> in it, some see a parallel to the warfare between God and Satan. Many of Lewis's fantasies see the great lion, Ajan, as Christ. Basically, Jesus Christ. Well, actually, this would be more the New Age Christ, really, if the truth be known. This became Aslan, who lays down his life to free the, free the children from the curse of the evil witch, believed to be represented by Satan. He possesses a knowledge of greater magic. Oh, this lion called Azan, who is the Christ, has greater magic. Oh, like white and black witchcraft? Yeah, exactly. So he has a knowledge of greater magic than that of the witch. A magic that brings him back to life and destroys the witch's power. Sounds like the Wizard of Oz. The good witch, the wicked witch, witch of the West. This is the whole lie of the coming New World Order, One World Religion of witchcraft under the New Age. White and black witchcraft. This is what this, we were getting prepared for this way back then. This is what Harry Potter propagates. Good and bad witches. It's all an abomination to God. It is argued that in presenting a blend of fantasy with an analogy to Christian truth, Lewis hoped to encourage his readers to search out truth further. This, however, was not Lewis's intention in writing his fantasies. Rather, he was genuinely enamored with mythology and believed that, the, that any story he wrote to take precedence over any preconceived moral idea. In Lewis's own words, there's another quote from good old C.S. Lewis. This was a quote in Of Other Worlds, page 36. Some people seem to think that I began by asking myself, this is about writing his stories, some people seem to think that I began by asking myself, how could I say something about Christianity to children? And he's admitting here that this is these books primarily a lot are geared toward children. <clears throat> and then he goes on to say, then fixed on a fairy tale as an instrument. So in other words, you know, did he say something about Christianity by fixing on a fairy tale as an instrument? And then he goes on to say, then collected information about child psychology, and decided what age group I'd write for, and then I drew up a list of basic Christian truths, hammered out all the allegories to embody them. This is pure moonshine, he says. I couldn't write that way at all. Everything began with images. A fawn carrying an umbrella. The, the fawn he's in reference to here is Pan. Okay, the god of sexual lust. A fawn carrying an umbrella. A queen on a sledge. A magnificent lion. At first there wasn't anything Christian about them. Well, there never has been. He goes on to say that element pushed itself of its own accord. This man is a out-out, out-and-out devil from the pit of hell. So he, he admits that these stories, he didn't start out, there was no Christian theme, it just, they worked themselves out this way of their own accord. He had no, this wasn't, this wasn't about drawing people to Christ and getting people saved and converted and getting them in the sound fundamentals of the faith. This was anything but that. This was a, this was the, the fruit of his own demon-possessed, mythologically-obsessed, pagan mind, influenced by the devil. That, this was the fruit of that. His writings were. So, we see that Narnia was not by design a Christian allegory. Yet, even if Christian allegory or analogy was Lewis's intention... The fact is that the truth of God, when couched in terms less than accurate, is a leavened lie. A leavened lie. You cannot 